So thank you everyone for joining us for today's event. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that wherever we are in Australia, we're all on the lands of First Nations peoples, and this was land that was never ceded. So where I am, I'm at UTS, University of Technology Sydney, and I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I want to pay respects to Elders past and present, and particularly acknowledge their role in, in um, custodianship of knowledge for the land on which this university is built. It's pretty special. So we're at the beginning of Refugee Week 2021. It's an opportunity to recognise and to celebrate the richness and diversity that refugee communities offer us as a country. Diversity and excellence clearly go hand in hand. Diversity is not just critical to an equitable society, but it fosters creativity, productivity, innovation, and all of these things are good for every single one of us living in our community. But what we like to do in Refugee Week, as well as celebrate the richness and diversity of refugee culture, we also want to use this as an opportunity to reflect on the experience and ongoing challenges for those who arrive in Australia seeking safety. The theme of this year's Refugee Week is unity, the way forward. It comes off the back of the isolating and fragmenting experiences of 2020, in which communities from a refugee background were amongst the most impacted by COVID. And of course, Australia's migration and detention policies for people seeking asylum is in the national spotlight currently, with the ongoing plight of the Maru Gappen family, who you may have heard referred to as the Bilawila family in the media after the name of the town where they lived. So how can we all collectively head towards a stronger, safer and more inclusive society? It's my pleasure now to properly welcome the panellists. First, Hani Abdili. Hani Abdili is an in a journalism student, writer and poet. In 2014, Hani left her home country of Somalia to seek protection in Australia. She has received numerous awards for her community work and currently holds a five-year safe haven enterprise visa. She is an ambassador for refugee advice and casework service. Welcome, Hani. Bakit David is a volunteer interpreter at Mercy House of Welcome and was previously a volunteer at a youth organisation, Rotaract Australia. He is currently studying community services at TAFE. Bakit arrived in Australia from Sudan when he was 17. Welcome, Bakit. Ahmad Sawan is a solicitor at RACS, which he joined in 2018. Ahmad is responsible for coordinating the RACS Data Breach Project, which has helped over 400 people lodge a complaint to the OAIC regarding the 2014 immigration data breach. He also works on RACS Stateless Children Program, represents clients held offshore on Nauru and Papua New Guinea in their applications for transfer under Medivac and works closely with young people who were taken to Nauru as unaccompanied minors. Welcome, Ahmed. And last but not least, Dorothy Hodnot was principal of Holroyd High from 1995 to 2018, where one in every three students had been in Australia less than three years and about 60 students at that time were of refugee background. She has been a strong advocate for the human rights of children and young people, particularly refugee and asylum seekers. And in 2002, she established the Refugee Scholarship Fund, Friends of Zainab, now part of the Public Education Foundation, which helps young refugees and asylum seekers around Australia complete high school and go to university. She was awarded the Australian Human Rights Medal in 2014 for her work with disadvantaged young people and her advocacy for the rights of refugee students. Welcome, Dorothy. So now we'll open to the panel. And as I said before, feel free to start typing questions if you have questions. So I might begin with you, Hani. Hani, you are a published poet and have performed twice at the Sydney Opera House. You're currently a journalism student. What do you see as the power of the written word? <laughs> I think, Ferti, I can say a lot about that because um, I would like to um, use, I think like, um, if I actually acknowledge one thing with the current situation that we have on a temporary visa, it's really hard to actually wish for the future. And words for me are powerful. That is my hope. And I would like to um, answer that with a quote that 
um, Nelson Mandela said education is the most powerful weapon that can shape the world. Sorry about that. Um, honey, I was taking a sip of water. <laughs> Ahmed, we've seen the power of journalism. Speaking of the power of words, we've seen the power of journalism this last week in the, cover in the coverage of the Murugupan family and the swell of public support for them, including from members of the coalition government. Do you think the Australian public has a clear understanding of our country's government's policies on migration and detention? and particularly for visas for people who arrive seeking asylum, it seems that when we see cases like the Murugapan family, everyone has a whole lot of generosity to give. Do they really understand what we're doing? Yeah, thanks, Verity. Look, I, in short, I think probably not. I think, um, I think the Australian government has been very good at using a lot of buzzwords, such as labelling people who arrived in Australia um, either as illegal arrivals or trying to defend their policies by saying we're trying to stay strong on borders to sort of influence the public perception on the issue of refugees coming to Australia. And then I feel like what gets lost in this is um, sort of the very, the, the, the real people that are being affected by these, um, by this perception and by this sort of description where they have fled situations of incredible violence and persecution just to seek, to seek safety really. Um, so I think this is where the coverage of um, the Murugapan family and sort of highlighting the Australian government's treatment of them has been an incredible, incredible effort in terms of an incredible journalistic effort to both bring to light the horrible situation that this family in particular has found themselves in, but also to the larger issue that people seeking asylum and refugees in Australia face consistently and I would describe relentlessly um, for, from, the, from the government. Um, and just to remind them again of the pro how the process impacts real people and families. Um, I mean, it's brought to light again issues such as people spending years on end held in immigration detention, um, awaiting an outcome on their protection visa application, um, or the fact that even people who aren't being held in immigration detention but would have arrived in Australia back in 2013 and 2014 and would. Um, and we know now of people that are still waiting eight years or more for an outcome on that application, um, having developed, you know, strong ties to the communities they live in, only then potentially be asked to leave the country if they are unsuccessful with their application. Um, but even if they are successful, and I'm sure Hani and um, Bahid can speak even more to this, um, you're then only afforded a temporary protection visa, meaning that you have to go through this process all over again within three or five years um, depending on what you're granted. Um, and just to finish that thought off, I think it's sad for us to sort of witness the, I guess, the plight or the struggles of the Mur Murugapan family. I'm sure they wouldn't have wanted to have such a bright light shone on their situation. Um, but I think that it is important that this story stays with everyone so that public discourse around this topic stays alive and continues on and that as the public, we can hold the government um, accountable to their actions um, and what I would describe as their general indifference towards people seeking asylum. Yes, I think that in a way the Murugavan family shows the human face of the policies, doesn't it? Until, until you actually see how it impacts on a particular family, it can all seem a bit, you know, esoteric and, and far distanced from people. Um, and speaking about that, I mean, how you get people involved in the issue really is making people understand and feel empathy and put themselves in other people's shoes. So I might start with you, Bucket, but it's actually a question for everyone on the panel. For those who are just beginning to learn more, including our audience today, of whom many are high school and university students, how would you recommend that they begin to engage with communities from a refugee background and get to understand the issues? What do you think, Bucket? Uh, thank you, Varity. I think the only uh, things that I can ask others to get engaged with are people who are seeking asylum or refugee people, it's to, to ask them, to sit with them and ask them what kind of experience they had and what kind of story they have and listen to the story and acknowledge the story. That's, that's the only way, that's a very good way to get engaged with them. And that's a very good way to, in, to, to build that connection 
and to learn uh, from people who are seeking salam. And just to, I think it's a simple thing is just to listen to the story. And I knew like uh, Hani Adin is uh, she's writing, and that's a very powerful tool. Uh, uh, can can get uh, others to engage, and in particular the wider Australian community. Mm. What do you think, Dorothy? How how do you recommend people become engaged with both the communities and the issues faced by refugee communities? Well, you know, I mean, uh, I I worked in a school for a long time, and um, uh, I, I think I'll start by saying education is a fundamental human right. Um, one that we take a bit for granted here in Australia, but refugees can't take anything for granted, and particularly education. Uh, I've, I've just been stunned uh, this weekend by reading the latest figures for displaced persons from the UNHCR. It's 82.4 million people, that's 1% of the world's population is now displaced. Uh, and about, probably about 27 or 28,000 a million of those people are, are refugees. That's displaced outside their country. It's not situation not going to go away. Australia doesn't take a very great number of people. Uh, the latest uh, figures, of course, were there was a refugee intake of about seventeen thousand people in 2018, 2019, before the program ground to a halt with the pandemic. Uh, and out of that, there were six thousand eight hundred and forty-five children. Uh, most of whom came into our schools. So we had up to 60% of our students at Holroyd were, were of refugee background or refugee-like background. Um, and you, you ask what, I, what I'm, I might do as a principal or what I did as a principal uh, to, make, to make that work for our students. Well, I involved not only the kids, but their parents as well. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a program of bringing uh, particularly the mothers, but the fathers also, into the school uh, once a week for English lessons. We provided uh, childcare. We, uh, we, 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 we had, it was like a social grouping. And then we did excursions for parents because one of the things about refugees is that they, they, can't, they don't go anywhere. They don't have holidays. They don't go away for the weekend. They can't go anywhere. The, 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 the things that uh, control their lives, bind them to home, particularly the women. And so we, we ran a series of excursions for parents and kids and we took them to the zoo and we, we went to Canberra to see our seat of government. That must have been interesting. And we, we went to Vaucluse House and things like that. And we also, we also were involved with a, with a miraculous Rosemary Kariuki, who's our community person of the year in Australia. And uh, we, we had mothers and daughters evenings where, where we were able to, to bring women who weren't in social situation into, uh, into providing food and dancing and no men. And it was all terrific and things like that. Those are fairly important. But, but in the school, um, to, 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 to work, to make the school welcoming, inclusive, well, that, that doesn't happen by itself. And that's something that that students and teachers need to understand. You actually have to work on making an inclusive environment. Um, it's, it, it's, you have to consciously involve students from diverse backgrounds in the life of the school and include them be, because, and, and not exclude or marginalize them in any way. And you can do that without meaning to because, because what, what, you, what you do sometimes is that you assume that people who are new into the school or into a university or a TAFE college bracket are going to know what the ground rules are, but of course they don't. And, and so you have, to, you have to work to include people into the, the educational community and you have to make sure that they know they're being included as well and that everyone's part of that. So it's a, a cultural issue. The school has to change its school culture to being open and transparent and helpful because that's the other thing. It's, it's, uh, if, you, if you don't help people uh, when they're in a completely alien environment, then, then they tend to go and sit by themselves at lunchtime and so on. 
And everyone has to understand those rules, the ground rules, I mean. I don't mean the school rules, they're different. Uh, school rules are about, you know, don't bring your mobile phone to school and don't hit anybody and things like that. The ground rules are actually the, 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 the rules of social interaction. Uh, and they, they determine the way that we interact with each other. I mean, one of the things I, I did, I decided I'd take away all the barriers that, that, that existed for all of my students to their learning. Uh, and one of the first things I did as a principal was, was to dismantle all the school rules um, and, and then negotiate with the community. Out of that, we, cut, we got the, the concept of respect. And that, that and then its twin responsibility came to govern everything that we did in the school. And I don't think that you can have uh, you can have a welcoming environment without having respect for other people. Uh, that was deeply embedded in the way we ran the school. I made no judgments about, about the students uh, and their behaviour, unless they kept doing the same thing over and over, which you said, I have to worry about your intelligence, really, if you keep making this mistake again and again. But um, though, that, that, those core... Uh, concepts of respect and responsibility came, became the way that we, 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 we worked the school. So it, it, it wasn't about tolerance. Tolerance is about making do. It was actually deeper than tolerance. It was, it, it, it had, it was, it was a, it was a foundational thing. It was a respect for yourself. You couldn't respect yourself if you didn't respect others and you had to respect the community and you also had responsibility for, for what you were doing. Responsibility is about ensuring our individual and collective part in a, a respectful community. That's where I started from. And that was, that was remarkably successful, I have to say. Sorry. That That's amazing. Um, wonderful to hear that. I especially like the idea of throwing out the rules and then renegotiating. <laughs> and, and that being that it's respect. A bit edgy. <laughs> yeah. Could have gone all sorts of ways, but clearly it worked. Um, Honey, throughout Dorothy talking about that, you were nodding away. So I could see that that spoke to you. Um, what would be your advice about, you know, um, engaging with communities from refugee backgrounds and, and getting that communication happening? I think I will say listening. Because listening is, I think, it's so powerful. I think... Um, we have to listen to people's story deeply. And also, I think, I think like we need to like be clear with a lot of things. I think like we have like this idea of, uh, you know, there's a lot of blame in this system. And I think we should not blame the public. We should blame and keep, um, put a hold to the government that put people in prison and put people on certainty. Because you, like, you can have a future, but the future with sanctity, it doesn't work. Like, it brings people's hope. It brings a lot of things. So what I think is, like, all of us as a population, what we have to do is, like, we have to hold our governments into account about how they treat human beings. Because we are not goats. We're not, like, we, like, you can't fence people. Like, I think enough is enough. It's been longer than... Um, eight years that people are on a temporary visas and all that. But we have a, this idea, it's like the media versus the government, the government versus the public, and there's all this blame. We need to put those blame aside and just put actually, put, um, put account a system that put people in prison, a system that is de designed to actually like um, kill humanity by cell by cell. So my, my advice would be like listening and actually like, as a collective people, we should be able to put our governments into account and say enough is enough. People shouldn't be on temporary visas. People shouldn't be on a pending limbo. People shouldn't be humans are humans, no matter where they're born and who they are. They have, we all have an equal rights in the eyes of God. So why can't we just practice that? It's easy. <laughs> Salt. <laughs> Thank you for that, Hani. Um, Bakit, you're, you are deeply involved in volunteering and giving back to the community, which I think is really admirable. Um, and you're also sub studying a community services diploma at TAFE. So you clearly find community really important. How has, um, I suppose, both your studies but also your volunteering helped you? And why is community so important for you? Uh Actually, I found uh, volunteering uh, 
engaging with the community through the school while I was studying at Sabaton Senior College. And at Sabaton Senior College, I was in South Australia. Mm -hmm. And at the school, they have Rotary Club and Rotaract for, for people in our age. Uh, so during that time, we hold ma uh, every Monday, we hold uh, meetings and then, uh, and I became a member of that uh, Rotary Club. So every Monday we have meetings and through the meetings, I progressed to the next year. I was engaged with them. And then I was lucky enough to be a member of the of the executive team. So where I have to work with the manager of Rotary. And then during that time, we do a lot of volunteering work to the community. So that's why we see the real Australian uh, spirit uh, because you get engaged with Australian people and you interact and you share this uh, aim because everyone's coming there to volunteer. And I found a lot of teachers, they sacrifice their time to come and volunteer. And it's very rare to find teacher volunteering or someone who's volunteer, volunteers their time. But that's really uh, resonate with me. And also I have also I have been in touch with my teacher. He was always says, uh, if I have, uh, I have a minute to watch a TV and there is someone who needed help, I would rather go and help. So this kind of uh, uh, a link this kind of uh, like uh, link with teachers and getting engaged, uh, actively engaged in the school environment, this will link you to the community as a student. And then it also will help you to see really uh, how Australia is because part of our, like, uh, our, our volunteering program, we have to do Sausage, uh, we have to cook barbecue sausages at uh, Bunnings uh, on Saturdays. And there is, you will see every person coming out of uh, Bunnings. They could say, 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 they could say, smile and say hi, and they could say hi, mate, and then they take a barbecue. And then those monies also goes back to the community itself. So this kind of like, it's so small, but it means a lot to a person like me. I wanted to learn the language. Someone says hi, hi, mate, and some other would come and jokes. They say they would say, "Ah, oh, would you put, uh, would you put onion first, or would you put sausage first? Which was, which ones got first on the bread? So you will learn this, and this will engage you to the community. And I will encourage all the uh, a student to get engaged with the community as well as to get engaged with the teachers at the school, and that's. That will uh, make a good link uh, to volunteering, and and that was was a way for me to get engaged actually. And after that, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, study at TAFE, and also I am currently working in the community service as well. That's fantastic. That's a really good advice to other students out there, just getting involved in volunteering and getting involved in the community. Um, Ahmed. We've had a number of people sort of talk about the big structural difficulties facing asylum seekers in Australia, and Hani really outlined that very strongly. Yeah. What are some of the challenges you face in your daily work just helping people to navigate the Australian legal system? Yeah, so I think it's important to obviously keep in mind all those larger issues because they're at the core of then what can force change and make this, these processes easier. But I mean, day to day for us, as everyone is aware, um, you know, the law in general and law in Australia can be incredibly complex. And this is especially the case for the laws surrounding the process of seeking asylum and migration laws. Um, and the people we assist at RACS um, largely either don't speak English or don't speak it as a first language necessarily um, and so rely heavily on services like RACS to navigate the process. Um, in turn, we rely, again, heavily on, on translators and interpreters um, to make sure that we're able to sort of explain everything and explain the processes as best we can to our clients. Um, 
and that can be tricky in a sense because not only are you navigating the um i guess uh making trying to make it plain english or trying to sort of bring it down to um to something that everyone can understand but also making sure that that language that you're using is also easily interpreted and making sure that you're keeping everyone informed and making and and that they're aware of their situation and what's happening um another part that is very day-to-day -day and something that we struggle with a lot and we've already touched on this a little bit but um just in terms of how slow the processes are by the government to sort of resolve these applications and to resolve the situations of people who are seeking asylum here um i've obviously heard it firsthand and i'm sure bahit and hani again can speak a lot more to this but just how draining that process can be and how obviously stressful it can be in terms of how long it lasts and with rax we often have to act as a sort of conduit to that and just um try our best to manage those expectations and make sure that rax as a as a sort of legal um center is there to support to support them as the as we're working through this process um and i guess making sure that we're all sort of engaged in that together um to eventually reach an outcome and do you must have victory some of the time yeah you definitely do no look you definitely do um i think <laughs> I don't want to sound too pessimistic about everything and you obviously do get victories I think um with um with temporary visas sometimes the victories are a bit of a bittersweet moment because it provides a bit of a safety net but obviously in an ideal world you'd hope that it would be more permanent protection and a more permanent solution for these people who have fled um fled horrific situations um but yeah i think for for me at least on a personal note i just feel incredibly grateful to to be able to be you know doing this work and and i hope that my work and sort of everything i do on a day to day basis might end up you know um helping someone out and really like changing their outlook on life and hopefully giving them a second chance at sort of building a life in the community building a life and making sure that they can make the most of it mm -hmm. so hani and bakit i might go to you first hani you know Australia has pretty hostile processes and policies for people who who come here seeking asylum and protection. So why do people try to come here? Uh, um people come here cuz I would I you know like sometimes I don't like talking a lot. I like to they like, answer things with one of my favorite poet Warsan Shir as she said no one leaves home until home turn into mouth of shark mm -hmm. and i think i would answer with that and we have like this white people living what this is happening no no one actually want to leave their loved ones behind no one want to like walk on a unfamiliar um street no one want to have like no one actually like want to leave the smell they get to use gets to know so people leave because they were forced to leave and i always i always whenever i see these policies and what we left behind i always call these policies like running from a cheetah but you're running into a lion that is somalia was a cheetah and australia is a lion they both cats but with a different purpose so i think yeah it, it sort of like makes me like to question every day like why why but the main reason people live because we need safety we need um we need a place that we can call home sometimes you can't call home here and you can't call home back so we like we are living in this limbo so people live because home turn into a mouth of shark you can like yeah it is yeah that that was replying <laughs> oh she can tell you're a poet honey that's amazing running from the cheetah into the lion i thought that was an amazing way of putting it um that is the australian policy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's really really beautifully put um depressing but beautifully put um Bakit what what about you why why do you think people same as what Hani said or have you got anything to add to that Oh uh, yeah uh, I would say actually it was same yes uh, safety is the biggest concern and it's not only here it's international it's uh it's a human uh like it's everywhere you could see uh, people migrating uh, from Africa to Europe or from Middle East to Europe it's a safety issue and also uh, uh in a the western world uh it's known for like advocating for human rights and and taking a leadership position so 
that why when we when we move from our countries to sacrifice and to come to this uh, to come to Australia or to other countries, we wanted to to see like someone who could advocate for us as well as someone who stand uh, uh, stand and uphold human uh, rights and human values. So because we are so vulnerable and we needing a lot of help, it's easier for us to 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 see the person who could help and and if it's safer and if it's uh it's encouraging we will we would rather go to say because we wanted to need that protection and we want uh we want that help i think the uh, yeah and also uh media was attractive uh in terms of uh, like attracting us to come to europe uh sorry to come to western world because uh media plays very uh, critical role as well because they would see uh, what's happening in like uh, war zone and also they will convey their message to the uh, to the other uh, to the western media mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's also being done through journalism uh, so therefore it's also kind of attract us because you will see uh, someone for example in australia will talk about incident in sudan and that kind of attractive because you as a migrant or a person who's seeking asylum, you 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 wanted to to you want that person to be there to advocate for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing as well could help you uh, to to come to Australia or to any other country. Mm. Yeah. So Dorothy, um, what can our schools do, and what can our young people do? I suppose to be firstly more aware of the experience and challenges of refugees and people seeking asylum, but possibly also to help seek change. Can you repeat that again? I was just having trouble with my mute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're sort of, you know, we're hearing all the issues that Australia has with the way that we treat refugees and asylum seekers. Yeah. So my question to you was going to be, what can our schools do and what can our young people do and people who work in education to first to be more aware of the experience and challenges of refugees, but then to actually seek change or dr help drive change in the way that we treat refugees and asylum seekers in this country? Yeah, well, there are two, there are two issues there. One is the schools. And um, I would see as part of the duty of care that schools have to their students that they that they actually need to um, to explore what what the real needs of the students in their care are. I mean, if you're a if you're a, a high school and you've got a a young uh, asylum seeker come to you and that person is 17, which is of course now over the the minimum age for leaving. I still think that you should en enrol that student uh, into the school. Some schools don't. And uh, we need to look at things like enrolment policy. Where is a young person in that sort of, mm, age, uh, that in-between age group? Uh, there were 22% of the, of the refugees who came to Australia in 2018-19 were aged between 17 and 29. Now, where is it, where's the best place for the younger group of that, those students to uh, to be enrolled, I think in a school which is sort of small scale and which can actually individualise both the the pastoral care for the student and and the education and, and it's a secure sort of place. So I think I think we need to be more more open minded and less maybe legalistic in schools about uh, about enrolling older students in our schools and our high schools. We need to think about what the the real needs of children are. Uh, who come to us from refugee backgrounds. They've all been through trauma. They've all got interrupted education. They have all lost just about everything along the way. And that includes family members as well. So, so we, need to, we need to actually be able to, 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 to set up support mechanisms in the schools to, to help them adjust to the new life that they're leading. And that might mean actually working with the parents, moving, moving the parents into support groups like STARTS, which is a service for the treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors, where people might gain from that sort of counselling. We need to be able to refer uh, people uh, into, into um, further assistance beyond the scope of the school. And, we, and I think we should also 
not be seeing the school as being, you know, well, it's three o'clock. Uh, we can't, we can't, we can't meet to discuss your your issue. And when you're dealing with refugee children, you've got a lot of things to think about. We had to think about our basic health care, dental care, for example, and 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 supply that. We we found that um, towards the end of my my work there, we had uh, an intake of Syrian children, and uh, a lot of those children were. Uh, were quite deaf and they were deaf because their eardrums had suffered damage from the bombing that they'd been subjected to. Now, when you, when you start to un, unpick things, you actually have to be sympathetic to those things. As far as students go, uh, as well as teachers and so on, I think we need to walk in the shoes of the refugees much more than we do. We need, we need that empathetic approach to, to dealing with people. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, people seeking asylum and people, people who are refugees are an important part of our Australian story. There's been, since the 1930s, about a million refugees have come to Australia. Mm -hmm. A lot of the population is, mm -hmm. is descended from people who were refugees. And uh, that, we, don't, we don't acknowledge that. It's not out there in the public discourse. It's not there in the school curriculum. Mm -hmm. Children aren't taught about the migration story, which is one of the great success stories of Australia. It's almost as though we were a bit shamed of it and we put it aside. And I think we need to be doing that. For young people, there are lots of places to inform yourself. I, I really don't think you should go into, into these debates without information. You can go onto the UNHCR website and find out what the rules are. You can read, you can read the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You can read the Refugee Convention. They're all downloadable from the net. You can join groups, like you could join, um, you know, Women for Refugees, or you could join um, uh, UNICEF and Amnesty and things like that. And you need to, but you need to be informed. You need to approach this debate with your head and not just your heart. Your heart is what you bring to the issue with the refugees themselves. But your head is what you argue with uh, an, uh, an often obdurate and cruel uh, set of policies that the government's put up to exclude uh, some asylum seekers from our, our community. So you, you've, got to, you've got to be informed. And it's easy to get that information. And there is a lot of information available in schools, which is, which have, is a great, it's probably gathering dust in the school library as I speak. I, I think that those are the things we need to be looking outwards. We need to maintain our human empathy. Remember that we have more in common than we have which is different in, in, in our common humanity. Those are important things. Wonderful. Um, so my next question, I'm actually going to now go to the audience. So the audience have been asking questions and there's some lovely ones in there. So I'm going to start doing them. And I might start with the one that's got the most number of votes so far, which is from Alison Cork. And she's asking, I might get you to lead this off, Dorothy, actually, but I'll ask each of our panellists this question. Is there any chance we will see a royal commission into refugees, asylum seekers and our treatment of them? What do you think, Dorothy? Do you think there's any chance of that? No, I think it's extremely unlikely. I don't, I don't think that... Um, that the, 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 the murkier ends of, um, of, of the treatment of asylum seekers are things that the government wants to be uh, dragged into the light under, un, un, under you know, sort of the, the power of a Royal Commission, which uh, is compelling people to, to speak the truth. Uh, and uh, the treatment of the, um, the Tamil family, Murugappans, is, is a good example of that. What, what possible justification uh, can you have for treating children in that fashion? Uh, and it's, of course, a breach of... Uh, it's a breach of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which Australia is a signatory. Uh, and it's a, breach of, it's a breach of what would be the law in, uh, uh, in, in every state jurisdiction. You know, I, I, I was a mandatory reporter of child abuse. Mm -hmm. and, and the emotional abuse of those children alone would have would have made me have to make a report to the relevant child protection authorities about, about that. The incarceration of those children, um, the, um, you know, just a whole 
lot of stuff there which which would be reportable in our community now when I, i'm sure the government doesn't want all of that starting to be unraveled uh in in a public forum so no i don't think we're going to see a royal commission Ahmed, what do you think do you think um you know is it something we should be pushing for or is this just unlikely to happen yeah, I think I'm in the same boat as Dorothy. I, I can't see uh, sort of, I can't see how it would happen. I don't think the government would be willing to sort of um, accept that, take that on. Um, I just think, yeah, again, I agree wholeheartedly with everything Dorothy said. Um, there's just too much there that, um, that the government would not want to be sort of out there in the public and in the form of a sort of royal, uh, royal commission. Um, what we do have and what we can all refer to is reports by the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, ombudsman reports that are out there that have investigated this, um, even some international sources. Um, but I think that's probably going to be the limit of that and I can't see a Royal Commission coming into it. Yeah. Um, I'll ask you the next one too, uh, um, Ahmed, because it's a, got a legal focus. Uh, Rhonda Duham asks, with the newly passed Migration Amendment Bill, do you think we will be seeing an increase of refugees in detainment now that they can't be deported? What can be done to rally for the law to be revoked? Yes, that's a really good question. It's a very specific legal question. <laughs> but I think, no, you're right. I think the way the, the Amendment Bill sort of came to pass, or at least was displayed, it was... I think well hidden behind this facade of we're just enshrining it in law that people who are found um, to be owed protection or found that if they were returned to their country of origin, they would be harmed. We are now not going to deport them. Um, although that has been practiced this whole time, now they just sort of codified it. Now the issue there becomes that yes, exactly what Rhonda mentions is that because they can't be returned and because they were would have been detained, for example, for not holding a visa or whatever the situation was that resulted in them being detained, they are now stuck in limbo, almost reinforcing this notion of, well, they will be detained until a viable solution is, is reached. But, yeah, so I think, um, I think uh, you're very right. I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a sort of, I saw it as a very sneaky way or very sort of sneakily way to introduce the idea of indefinite detention in a very real sense, which is incredibly disappointing for my government. Is there anything we can do to rally for it to be revoked? <clears throat> I mean, again, um, the strongest thing is always, I think, public opinion and public discourse and make sure to um, sort of stay educated and knowledgeable on these topics, like when this passed, to make sure to look into it and see what, I guess, the experts in the field are talking about it and what the idea is. And then from that, just remain engaged with your local MPs, remain engaged mm -hmm. with your communities to make sure that your voice is heard. Because I think the only real way that a lot of this stuff can change and that we can make sure to hold the government accountable is to have that public discourse and to have that strong public opinion that can hopefully shift some of these government policies. Mm. Yeah. So the Nick, thank you for that. Um, the next question is from Mary Jones and it's Fahani and Bakit. So I might start with you, Bakit. She's asking, what kind of an impact does a temporary protection visa have on your life? Yeah, the temporary protection visa had uh, a lot of impact. Uh, the first of the impact that, uh, uh, like, because it's a short-term visa, it can limit and restrict uh, people rights. Uh, for example, accessing education, and it's very hard uh, because uh, we're not considered to be an Australian or permanent uh, permanent protection holders. So we cannot access education, that's the other thing. As well as uh, it will limit our, our right to access other services like the, uh, like the, the, like the uh, other, Austra other Australian can access those services. For example, uh, we cannot access a uh, service like uh, applying for housing. You cannot uh, apply for housing as well as uh, because it's limited, so it kind of put person into positions that they can move forward with their life to make progress. And 
you see it stays there you know it keeps you there and it just uh it's very hard position to be in mm. it's emotionally hard as well as mentally as well and for like for people who don't get access to housing uh in terms of that as well because there is an increase because of covid there is increase in uh homelessness uh, uh, uh and, and particularly people who are seeking uh, asylum in australia and that's very hard uh, uh it, it's very hard for them to access those services as well as because they are because it's uh, related with emotions so people uh we will get trapped into a situation and it's kind of mentally a uh, very hard situation to be in. And also because it's related with uh, accessing to service. If a person does not have a uh, good qualification uh, during this COVID as well, uh, they cannot get a uh, good work or the work that they desire to, to keep them, uh, to work, uh, sorry, to keep themselves uh, or at least to have some income that they can depend on, as well as because there is a because there is an increase in a increase in a services. Uh, sorry, because there is an increase in a, because there is an increase in a people. Uh, sorry, because there is a decrease in uh, people uh, trying to to seek for services. They, uh, Sorry, I, I. Sorry, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's exactly right, though. I, I really like the point you made about how you can't get access to the physical services and supports, but it's also got an emotional and mental impact. It's quite debilitating. Um, Hani, do you have anything to add on that about the impact that being under temporary visa can feel like? Yeah, I think um, I would. I emphasize more actually what um, Packet said, which is the mental health. Because like, um, like I think like what we don't understand more is like it's, it's okay like you're free, you're outside, but like a freedom. By the time you like you get all you wanted, you're actually mentally damaged. Like and this actually it's and also I think like the government, if they're gonna put us on a temporary visa, this they should set up a permanent. Um, counseling for us <laughs> it will be like five years of counseling i will be happy with that i think the mental health actually that comes with this is like a, a lot and i think people are actually losing their mind and i think COVID 19 also like uh, contributed into that a lot because there's you you won't be able to get government assistance you don't get all the things like and that makes you more worthless that makes people like become more mentally damaged by the mm -hmm. time actually i think like, by the time everyone gets a permanent residence or citizens they will be like ending up in a cycle hotel like, <laughs> yeah i'm just this is my thing and i think like that is like you know you, you can have like and i you know like I love like, you know, what RACS does and all the community services that we have. But certainty is one thing. Like certainty, you need certainty in our lives. Like, you know, that is what we need. You need purpose. You can have you can have all the things, other things you need, but if you don't have if you don't have the certainty, that affects like the mental health of every individual who are on a temporary visa. Some people are actually on a six month visa. Like, how can you live on a six month visa? Like at least like us who are on a temporary protection visa, at least we got like five years of uncertainty. But how do you live? What do you do? Like, do you get, can you get a lease? Like, can you go to the real estate and be like, I have a six month visa, can you rent me a house? That is like the contribution. The government don't understand. They think they're fixing things, but they're actually contributing 100% into homelessness and into the mental um, health of this country. Like they're making people crazy by introducing policies that will give you, doesn't like, should you like with a gun but mental shot like you know people are going crazy so mm -hmm. i would support the mental health of this people need a proper uh, settlement or proper counseling five years of give me five years of visa and five years of counseling <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think you're totally right i think living with uncertainty is impossible like really really psychologically difficult so you're spot on honey it's in it's ridiculous that we make people suffer like this. Um, Dorothy, I'm going to, I'm a bit mindful of the time, but I do want to ask you this question because I know you'll know the answer, and um, which is around 
refugee children on temporary visas and whether or not they can go to university? And what's the answer? The answer is yes, they can. Uh, that, that, uh, that particular issue was one that I fought uh, very hard um, oh, 20 years ago almost now uh, with the right to continue education beyond the age of 18 at school and get an HSC and the right to go to university. However, the problem is that universities are obliged to charge full international student fees for people on temporary visas. And that includes, of course, asylum seekers. Um, so what, what, we've, what we've had to do is establish a, a, uh, a support system through the universities of scholarships for young people on temporary visas from a refugee or asylum seeker background so that they can attend. And that means full scholarships. That can mean, you know, I mean, $120,000 uh, uh, could be the cost of a degree. And it also, it also means that uh, people are going to need some form of support while they're uh, at university because, mm -hmm. as you understand, most asylum seekers are not entitled to any form of financial support after they turn 18. So what I did initially was, uh, as, as more of our students, uh, asylum seeker students at Holroyd, got, got um, HSC results that were good enough to get them into university. I negotiated an individual level with the universities about scholarships. But then it, 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 it seemed that there were other students who were, who were like that. So I started writing to all the uh, high schools, the public high schools, uh, with, with um, asylum seeker students saying, give me a list of the names of the people who are competitive and will submit that to the universities. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that uh, has been taken over since uh, since then by, by the Department of Education. I convinced mm -hmm. the department to carry on that program because it was actually making a life difference to young people. Um, and, and only four weeks ago, I had six young people, former students, arrive at my house for morning tea, which went on until afternoon tea time, I, I have to say. Six, six of them all had been helped at school by our, our support processes. All of them had been to university. They were all graduates of university. They were all in full-time employment, all very terrific young people making their way in life, but three of them on temporary visas. And so three of them, three of them had needed that sort of additional support to go to university. So if, 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 you, if you're a teacher in a school, and it could be a rural school, it could be a metropolitan school, and you've got uh, a student uh, an asylum seeker student who's good enough to go to university, make sure that you get in touch with the multicultural education people in the Department of Education and say, uh, this is my student, we shouldn't miss him or her out of, uh, from that list. Most universities now do offer humanitarian scholarships and I have to say Verity UTS has a very generous allocation of those scholarships. Yes, thank you for that and I do want to urge anyone who's on the line who is a I'm a student from a refugee asylum seeker background and on a temporary visa. UTS offers 16 scholarships a year for humanitarian students where we um, forgot you don't have to pay any university fees. Um, and we also have philanthropists to help with your living expenses. But we're not the only university. So there are other universities who do this as well. So please, please, please make sure you check out universities um, and see their scholarship options because there's lots available for you. Now, we've only got three minutes to finish, so I thought I would finish with Hani and, and Bahit, since you are our stars. Um, now, you're both at the moment studying in ho either higher education at university or in TAFE. And can we end on a simple question, which is what do you hope to do once you've finished? Bahit, what do you hope to do? Uh, I'm currently studying TAFE. I'm studying community services. And when I finish, uh, I will be. I would like to study to study social work at Shaw and to continue advocating for for others. That's wonderful. So you're continuing your volunteering and community activity on into your professional career. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Um, Hani, what do you plan to do when you're finished? Um, I want to be um when I finish my degree. I want to be a political correspondent. 
keep score more under control. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you could be a political correspondent. <laughs> I think yeah, because I think that is I wanna I wanna use um, journalism and creative writing as a way of enhancing um, humanity because I think and I think we have a great amazing journalist in our society who inspires me all the time and I wanna I wanna like um, I wanna water the seeds that they put on the ground and keep on going. That is wonderful. So both of you are going to make a huge contribution. So thank you so much. Um, we're very, very lucky to have you here. Um, so thanks again to all of our panellists. It's one minute to two. So I will now thank everyone for coming. Thank you all for contributing and taking time out of your busy lives. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. I think you'll agree that that was a really great panel and a really interesting insight and hopefully knowledge. Um, and hopefully also giving people a bit of um, inspiration to go out and actually fight for the rights of refugees and asylum seekers in this country to be treated fairly, fairly under the law and in accordance with the international obligations that we've signed up to. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. As usual, the podcast, this will be available um, online. We record it and we'll send the link out to everyone if you want to share it with your contacts and networks. Um, and thanks again and we'll see you all soon.